we see Artemis one as the starting point. So we're in the long run. We'll be investing on the moon mission for the next few years. So we want to develop a community of people that have an interest for space exploration. We need to develop our know-how, our technology, our expertise in immersive live streaming, in producing content, etc. I mean, in, in the, for, around the Artemis mission. And as well, we need to establish partnerships and test new business model. Obviously, the objective of this program and what we're doing is, is to make it accessible to a very broad audience. In that sense, we need to build partnerships with distributors, with telcos, uh, with platform vendors. So we have a great relationship, and we'll be talking about that later on, with different platform vendors. Uh, we need to test new business model. How do we finance that? How do we, how are we able to produce what we're doing? And as you can understand, it's far from being cheap. It costs fortune. Uh, we are testing different models. One of them is sponsor content to Dome. So uh, in the deal, when we're distributing the content to Dome to provide some context, we're asking the Dome to provide food traffic to make sure we can aggregate data and understand what kind of viewership we can generate by offering this content to Dome. And the deal is this. We make this content available live and or on demand for three months. We're asking for food traffic. So to know many people have seen it. And obviously, we're asking the Dome to at least show the event once. So it gives us the capacity to know who will be offering this event and obtain some data on who will be viewing it. And in regard of business model, we're also integrating sponsors within the content. This is not easy either, because for multiple reasons, we don't have a lot of track record. How much it worth for a sponsor to be integrated within an immersive event like this? What's the ROI? Uh, how much money we should charge? How do we integrate their brand? How do we integrate their story within our story? And in regard to business model as well, obviously we we have an interest to license our content down the road. So we see the Artemis One immersive launch as a lost leader uh, to bring interest with different partners for the moon mission with the hope that we'll be able to license Artemis 2 and Artemis 3, and this time hopefully not for free. <laughs> uh, the show itself, as you can understand, it's a live program. It's the first time that we, my, for the best of our experience, that we can see an immersive launch of a rocket. My colleague Andrew will talk a lot more about the technical aspect of it, but it's far from being easy to do. It's roughly an 80 minute show. Uh, we are including within the show live segments and pre-produced content. And also the show is available within, in multiple formats. We have hosts on the ground and we have a full production team on the ground as well with multiple cameras and multiple angles. Our objective is to provide a sense of proximity with the rocket to make it as great as you are there, physically speaking. To be honest, our camera are even closer than anyone else, anybody. Uh, so that's the intent, to provide, provide a sense of proximity with the rocket. We have multiple cameras set up at Kennedy Space Center, so my colleague will talk a lot more about this. Um, the marketing aspect of this. Promoting an immersive rocket launch is not that easy. People don't exactly all know about the Artemis program, and immersive technologies uh, are still quite new. So obviously we uh, have invested a lot of energy on the PR campaign to inform the media about the availability of our immersive launch. We have also set up uh, some, in some domes the capacity for media to watch the event live. We have been very aggressive on social media. We have distributed a lot of promotional content um, and uh, as, as well as images, photos, behind the scenes, uh, there were some content we've captured during the rollout, etc., to generate awareness about what we're doing. Obviously, our best way to reach people is to work with partners and distribution partners. So in that sense, we have on board the telcos, we have on board the multiple domes in collaboration with our dome distributors, and more partners we have, more distribution we have access to, more people will be able to reach down the road. 
the, I will talk about the partners, but our main partner for this operation is Midwest. They are the one that are given, giving us the chance to do all this. And uh, the last part is digital advertising. Uh, in regard of ads, we've not done that much prior to the launch, which was a great call, considering the launch had not happened yet. <laughs> So we're keeping our budget for after the launch when we'll have the content in our end, which is not the case yet. Although uh, we've done some tests, we've tested our formats, we've tested we've test a different angle, and our strategy will be mainly to promote uh, the post that we'll be doing of the rocket launch. So it'll be a uh, paid post, uh, because we believe that the segment that will have the highest interest from a, a broad population perspective will be the rocket launch itself so we produce a specific segment with this. The marketing funnel. So obviously, we need to think broad for this. So we're using legacy platform, I mean traditional platform, to expose what we're doing, which is the top of the funnel. And then we are using what we call non set base or broad 360 platform, such as domes, um, such as mobile operators, 2D 360 on phones, uh, running exhibit to promote our experience and what we're doing. Obviously, the intent is to bring everyone to our community. Why? Because we need to have a way to communicate with the audience. The launch has been scrubbed three times now, or we don't know how many times, so we need to develop a way to communicate with the fans. So we are bringing them to our social media, to, uh, we're asking them to follow us on Facebook and or to subscribe to our mailing list. And obviously the end of the funnel is to see the full experience within MetaQuest, where people can watch the VR experience of what we're doing. Partners, partnerships. Uh, like I was saying, MetaQuest is our main financial partner for this, this great adventure, but we are also distribution partners. We're working, obviously, with Meta themselves to distribute our content on MetaQuest on Facebook. Uh, we have made deal with Telcos. Uh, our idea for Artemis One was not to be too broad with Telcos, but mostly to test what we can do with them in the future. So we've worked with LGU Plus, which is um, a telco based in Korea, and Orange, which is based in Europe, mainly France and multiple urban territories. In regard of dome distribution, we could have not done anything without the help of our dome platform vendors. Uh, we've worked with many of them, um, so from Cosm, RSC Cosmos, uh, even Settlement SkyScan, SSI, Kanika Minolta. I need to provide a special thanks to Cosm. Uh, obviously, they have been a very great partner to us. And uh, from a platform perspective and a partnership perspective, we felt that dome casting and streaming to dome is key in their overall corporate strategy. Obviously, our partners have been great uh, in that sense, so we've been able to onboard through them, and a lot of that is coming from COSM, more than 165 domes in the world, which from the best we know, the biggest event of this kind ever I don't know if any of you have seen something more, but from what we've seen, I don't think we've seen some, anything like that before. Uh, I want to do a special mention about Planetarium uh, Rio Tinto, our partner for ever of the, of the studio. We've worked with them for everything we're doing uh, when we're porting our VR experiences to Dome. Uh, we're testing our content in this Dome. We're using their insights to produce the best Dome experience as possible. So. I have to say special mention to our host and also to our sponsors, uh, Amazon Alexa, um, uh, AWS, which is hosting all the experiences and provide the streams to the world and Airbus, and how we integrated them in our story. Uh, so in, in 30 seconds, uh, Amazon Alexa made a partnership with Lockheed Martin and Cisco WebEx to integrate the deep space video conferencing solution within Orion which called the Callisto Project, for the one that have an interest for this. Uh, the person that have, uh, uh, have built this project is from Alexa, and he was inspired by Star Trek. I know you know about the big screen in front of the ship, so they were trying to reproduce that within Orion. So technically speaking, uh, you can use voice to activate different elements of Orion. At this stage, it's only opening the light and starting the music. 
But down the road, they expect they will be able to do a lot more with voice recognition. So that's for my introduction. I will now uh, introduce to you Andrew Keenan, which is our 360 Live Production Manager for the R4 Fitting Symbol. I'll see how you do. So, uh, Olivier went over the strategy about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and uh, I'll go over uh, the tactical aspect about how to put something like this in place. So, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of planning going into this, obviously, how we get uh, and, and install ourselves at Kennedy Space Center. It was over a couple of months of scouting, uh, multiple trips uh, down to KSC, trying to figure out where we're going to put the cameras, how many cameras, uh, what access we have, because obviously this is not a place that everybody gets into um, every day of the week. And uh, being Canadians and foreign nationals, that adds an extra level of, uh, of uh, filtering that we had to manage. So like, ideally, you see in the top, uh, top portion, middle portion of this, of this uh, image here, we actually were trying to get cameras up on the tower next to the rocket as the rocket launched. Um, now those, and then one right beside it to catch the full effect in 360. Now those cameras probably weren't going to do too well <laughs> after the, the rocket launched, which as Olivia mentioned, it hasn't quite done yet. Um, so, um, and, and to do a 360, we're actually doing an 8K production. So uh, we, this has not been done before. And, and one of the challenges with the 8K production is actually getting the the images from the camera to the op center where we have this, this massive 8K production truck. Um, so we, we couldn't figure out actually solutions to get it that close to the vehicle and in the end NASA didn't want us that close anyways because they don't want cameras melting around them. They have their own cameras here. If, if anybody's watched the Apollo 11 the last while, um, it's amazing footage. I think that footage gives NASA about half their current budget just for that, that one mission. So it is, it's somewhat true, not fully true, that the camera is a mission in some cases. Uh, but we ended up having six locations. It ended up being trimmed down to three in the end, just about a month before we launched. Um, what you see here is the, the red items here in the chart are where we were trying to get to, and we got down to the orange items with one within 400 meters of the vehicle <clears throat> and uh, one near what we call the beach about a mile away. And then one near what we have is the off center right in this press site that's set up for press at uh, near the vehicle assembly building where the vehicle uh, rolls out from. Um, so uh, there's a lot of constraints to deal with trying to get those camera locations in. Connectivity was a big deal. We had no idea how to get the signal out from KFC uh, to actually, you know, an 8K. It's, it's a lot of data you're trying to pump out and we had multiple multiple projections coming out for domes and uh, venues and the like. Um, and uh, we had to install these cameras for up to three weeks or more. So we had to protect them and power them. So it was, it was quite the technical challenge in order to implement this run of show that Felix Legeness and our director, Paul Wazikowski, had put together for us. Um, it, Olivier mentioned that uh, um, this type of show had never been done before, and every time we contacted a contractor to help us out with this, everybody said, this is crazy, this has never been done before. So it gave me a lot of confidence moving ahead. Uh, what you see here in the, in the uh, images is a red uh, zone here. That's actually an exclusion zone. You can't have people within that anomaly. Now, there are people within where we have our op center and the uplink, uh, but in case when the, the rocket actually launches, you can, depending on the winds, you can actually, you might have to evacuate that zone, but anything within that zone, it's about a four mile radius or six kilometers. Um, so getting cameras within that and operating them remotely was an important aspect of what we were trying to do. And uh, it was a big challenge getting in there. So um, this, this, this image talks about what we knew coming in. So the red is the stuff we didn't know how to do, the green is what we knew. Um, so uh, we, um, so we had a long-term uh, relationship with NASA. The image you saw of ISS experience and being on the ISS. I was actually uh, working on the ISS program with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency for almost 20 years, and, and I was part of the capture of the 
uh, external part. I, I, I started to lose bulk. We started to capture the external part as we're chasing the space walkers around outside. And it's a pretty impressive, uh, even for me to look at after all these years being on this, that program. But uh, I kind of went through all the challenges. We had, we had no connectivity to cameras, no, no power at the camera sites. We had no uplink from, from the broadcast truck up. Um, we had a lot of challenges with accessing the camera sites. We were trying to do this worldwide live in immersive 8K, which of a rocket launch that still hasn't launched and nothing like this has been done before. So we knew a couple things coming in, but uh, not a lot. So the next thing was to get partners that really helped us execute this run of show, this, this real amazing challenge we're doing. So the first partner we brought in is, is a company called Meanwell and Radiant Images. Um, so they're the ones that provided the camera. We actually went through a number of different cameras. We tested a, a number of different cameras, trying to get challenging between um, capability, but also robustness and the remote aspect, because these cameras had to be turned on <coughs> uh, and run. And we actually even looked at, we actually had a redundancy put in place too, because we didn't want to miss the big shot here. So Meatball came in, uh, they're the, they actually were the overall integrators for the entire network. So going from camera to broadcast truck, out into, uh, into the cloud, and then we did the cloud processing with AWS, another partner. But they were, they were our first people we contacted because um, Felix and Paul had never done a live VR broadcast. So we, we, were, we were trying to get people that knew a little bit about that, and, and Meatball definitely did. Know about that. The other, they connected us here now with a flight line films from Las Vegas, <clears throat> and they had one of the only 8K trucks. Uh, even there, uh, they, uh, they had to do some modifications. And what flight line does, uh, it's a really good group of, of people, and they, they actually film uh, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin launches. They've done something like 20 of them so far. So they captured, they got uh, William Shatner. Captain Kirk flying up and coming back home. So they had a lot of experience with uh, rocket launches. It's quite important because uh, camera placement, audio is a, is a big part of this. We keep on forgetting about audio and having to catch up it later on. But, so these were the second major partners we had come in and they've been a big part of this whole uh, show going forward. Um, so how, do we, how did we con connect all the cameras to this Broadcast Center, which is near the, the iconic vehicle assembly building that, that uh, Apollo, the shuttles, and uh, Artemis has rolled out of. So uh, because there was no infrastructure to deal with, we had to look at having wireless connectivity. We couldn't rely on 5G because 5G was going to be swamped during the launch day. It was going to be too many people on it, too many people using it. Um, but we had to have, as I say, we have four camera sites. We had to, transmit those 8K signals to a central point in the off-center of where this broadcast truck is. And, uh, and initially we started looking at point-to-point uh, -point wireless RF bands, microwave bands. Uh, we even got FCC licenses for this. Uh, and working with different companies. Uh, through at and was a big player in this and Ericsson was ready to deploy. So we did site surveys of this and we had multiple proposals come in. And uh, um, Cost, 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 right? How are you going to do this with the cost margins we had? So that was, uh, we pretty much got there. We even submitted authorization requests to NASA, and NASA's not too keen on having high power RF near that, that beautiful rocket of theirs. The other thing we have is these uh, camera systems are power hungry. Uh, the big, uh, it's actually a 12K camera system, it's an Obsidian Pro from Pandal. Uh, when it's running, so uh, we had to figure out how we're going to power this thing when there's no there's no power cord to plug these things in, and so we it's actually the, the power supply comes from a company in Ontario, Canada here called Hybrid Power Solutions, uh, and because we had to deploy these cameras over a three week, maybe a month long period, we had to protect them from Florida weather. In August, it's you can't get much hotter than that or humid. And we're also near, you can see the water there, but this, this particular camera is uh, near the ocean. We were trying to get rain on the beach to get a nice atmospheric effect. You had the launch of a rocket near the ocean. That was a thing, but we, we had to get pushed in a bit because of environmental uh, constraints. It's, uh, they're, they're trying to re, regrow the, 
the, the, the bluffs there, the sand bluffs there. So, um, but we had to design and uh, build and test and integrate these environmental protection systems. That was done by a company here locally called MFS, MFX Productions here in Montreal. Um, and uh, once we installed the cameras, we wanted to check them out, obviously, to do daily or twice daily checks uh, of the camera system, the audio, make sure that everything's operating properly and uh, with the heat and not overheating. Okay. Um, so we, we also had to do command and control the cameras, so we had to design this control box that actually allowed us to communicate with them, uh, relative power to the different aspects of it, command and control this, this, this environmental protection system to rise and drop and, uh, and be able to do uh, debugging of the, of the system as we went forward. Um, for the uplink, uh, we were looking at doing RF. In the end, we had one of the challenges with the uplinks, we had the uplink to multiple platforms. So the domes took Dome Master, for those that don't know. Some of them took just the regular lat long. Uh, we also had a dedicated uh, projection to meta venues. Uh, they had for, for their own thing. And um, there's another projection I'm kind of throwing a blank on right now. So we had to send out about four of these 8K uh, transmissions. So we need a pretty heavy uplink. And down the bottom here, you can see how we're actually receiving signals from KSC, both from the cameras and from the NASA feeds, uh, iso isolated feeds. We had to get all that stuff up. And what ended up happening, <clears throat> um, I think OAD already went through this, all our distributions and where we're going to, but this is all, we all had to, we had to deliver all these different formats, all these different places, including different audio formats. Uh, so we brought a bunch of solutions together, and in the end, NASA actually had fiber lines that they allowed us to use, so we, had, we got around actually using RF point to point, and, uh, and that brought all these signals to the truck. We were able to do an AK broadcast in the truck, the flight line, and then we uplinked that through an AT&T panel, which gave us a, almost two gigs of uplink. And then we did transcoding and distribution using AWS Elemental. Now that was limited to 4K. We even implemented for certain domes, Cosm had a dome that we that actually took in live 8K. So we were actually able to implement that, that's down at the bottom of that chart there, and that Meemo actually implemented for us. So that means we had to show, so now it's getting there and putting everything in place. Um, for as long as the 10th is the 29th, we stuck around for the September 3rd, and then we went home. Uh, but as Olivia mentioned, we take about a week to, to, to install this thing, set it up, do testing, uh, do rehearsals, because we have hosts. There's, it's, it's a, the run of show is not just watching the vehicle. We have hosts, we have, uh, we have these animations that come in, and, and uh, it's quite a bit complicated there. Uh, so you can see the guys down below here actually setting up the camera, um, testing it out. And then to the top right, you can see our, our um, director, Paul Lizikowski, doing one of the uh, all hands at the start of the, the day. In this case, it's night because we had to start, we had to get there quite early before the big rush came in. Otherwise, we wanted to get, be able to get on site. Um, so we had to run a show. We saw a bunch of this at the opening video here. Um, the day of the, the 29th, we got, we got through a bunch of the run a show. A number of these items you can see down below. We're actually on the cover of the New York Times. That the image on the bottom left was, uh, it was just someone from the New York Times came through and they took that image. And I was on the cover that morning and it's actually our guys out there working on the cameras. Um, so we have near, near the vehicle, we have two, um, eight, 12K VR cameras uh, set up. Plus, we're also doing this dual production. We're actually capturing, we're, record, uh, we're doing a live stream, but at the same time, we're capturing in 8K what's happening to take that back and actually do post production on it. Um, so, a couple lessons learned. Uh, we, should have, we could have done a few more site surveys to really lock down where we're at. Um, you really want a capable team that's engaged. Now, you're doing 8K VR with a moon rocket, it's, it's hard not to be interested in that. But every time you talk to someone, it's like, yeah, you're doing that work, you definitely want it. Uh, the twin productions, as I say, the cinematic VR plus the live stream make things a bit more complicated. Um, audio, we had a couple problems with audio that we're, we're still 
going back now the third time, we're gonna we're gonna work through all. And you want something that's pretty interesting. So this this once this guy starts to launch, or actually launches, we are going and says, uh, we'll get there. So this is the team we had, the production. It was a pretty heavy footprint at NASA. Uh, we had to be careful with how we interacted with them. We didn't want to be overly demanding because we had, we had the largest footprint by far of any media at that press site. And uh, but we were ready that morning and we did, we did a good part of the run of show. We were again ready on the third. And then we went back for the end of uh, September. Hurricane came through and uh, now we're gonna be going back. Our, our, our time to go back is on the, we're flying back in on the 7th of November to try and get this rocket the last time. So this is inside the press, inside the, the newsroom, that's the newsroom. You see this image up there about the chronicles. We were there for the, the 1969 launch. And uh, so we're trying to do something new here, be the new chronicles of this new trip back to the moon. And with that, I'll hand it off to Olivia Hernandez, and uh, he'll carry it on. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So, my name is Olivia Hernandez, and I am the director of the Planetarium Rio Tinto Alcan. And I would just take a few minutes to welcome you here at uh, Espace Poladi Planetarium. I'm very happy, and I would to congrats also Loïc and the rest of my team, of course. Loïc is here. Thank you, Loïc, for, thank you for all the work. Thank you to NASA and the board for all the work also, and also to the SAT. It was a great partnership for this event. So thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to present you, and I, it won't be long, but I just want to present you in a few words, what is exactly Space for Life? You probably have heard about it <laughs> since today now. And uh, Space for Life, Espace pour la Vie, is in fact the, great, the biggest complex of science in Canada. And uh, we have almost 2 million of visitors here, not here at the Pedagogion, but in all Space for Life areas. So it's an enormous amount of person and visitors. And so we are very proud to, to, to touch so many people when we have to speak about science. And uh, Space for Life, Space for Life is composed of five museums, uh, the Biodome, just next to the planetarium here, the Insectarium, the Bot Botanical Garden, the Biosphere, and of course the Planetarium Radio. So, <laughs> Let's speak about the, the, the director perspective of such a launch, of uh, such an event, which is very difficult, in fact, for us, and how we can uh, address and present this live event to the public and to the media. Because it's not so easy. It's not so easy because, of course, it was a, a lot of pre preparation and uh, a rehearsal for that kind of event. As a, uh, uh, Olivier and uh, Andrew said, <laughs> but we face many uh, challenges, <laughs> and uh, the scrubs were a very a pain, not in the, but a, a very strong thing to do and to manage. In fact, because we have to cope with hydrogenic battery power problems and even a hurricane. So how do you uh, try to, uh, to present something to the public when you don't even know the real uh, date of the event? And uh, so it was very difficult and uh, we, we don't have yet the solution for the moment, but we choose to, to have a plan and to wait and to, of course, to, uh, to look for the different Windows launch. So this, this was the first Windows launch, of course, we missed the second period of the window launch because uh, of the uh, hurricane event and the, the, the problems that we face with, with the launch. And now we are scheduled to launch on November 14, but at <laughs> midnight, almost midnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as a director of Planetarium, I have 
a, a great team here, but we, we cannot work all day and all night <laughs> to, work, to, work, to wait for a lunch that will last a few minutes. So, um, how do you manage that? So, you, first of all, you have to, to look to the programming of the planetarium. And it's very complicated, even if the, the event is during the day, how you do manage to, to present this live show, this unique live show, when you have such uh, a programming. You, we have almost a 19 events, 19 shows in the planetarium during a long day. And so what happened? Do we have to cancel all the day for something that will be scrubbed? No, <laughs> that's not possible. Do we have to cancel only one event and to set ticket for this event? No, that's not possible also. So we decided to, to find another solution in order to present this live show. And the solution was to to maintain and to, to have uh, this live event during the show. So we, we, we plan if the, the time of the lunch was during the day and the, the shows, we plan to stop the shows five minutes before the lunch until two minutes after <coughs> the lunch and to present for the people uh, uh, who were in the, the dome to present a, very, a live show. But that, that was uh, the only method to reach at least uh, 300 people, 200 here and 100 in the other room, and to, to have access to, the, to, to this very live event. If it was outside the opening hours, then we can open before the opening hour, and we can close the planetarium also after the opening hours. But during the, mid the night, like the November 14, of course, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to ask people to go to, to the Pentagon to work during one hour or 80 minutes during the, the event and to go back to the home. And it's very difficult also to, to ask public and media to come during the night. So it's, it's not a solution. So the other solution is, of course, uh, to offer uh, a recorded event uh, outside or inside the hours after, of course, the, the lunch has been done. So let's say after one week after the, the lunch, in the, for example, the, the week of the 21st of November, we will have a package from uh, Felix and Paul, and we will be able to present it just outside of the hours or to replace when show with the, uh, the, the event. So this is the solution that we, we try to, to put in place. We don't have the, the, the opportunity to test it for the moment because of the, of the many scrubs, but I'm pretty sure that we will be able to do that. And what will be the lesson that we learn about all of this and to conclude, in fact? These are the 12 men that have been on the moon. I'm pretty sure that many of you know three of the names of the 12 people. So I know that there's one guy here called André Manchon, one of my astronomers, who knows each name of the 12 men. <laughs> But we, maybe you know one or two or three uh, name of the, the astronaut here. But you're looking to only 12 men. And the purpose of the mission of the Artemis One is to be sure that one female astronaut is going to the moon and to walk on the moon. And this is very important. And this is what we are doing this. I just want to be sure that one of these 20 women, maybe only it will be an American woman, I guess, but I, I have had also uh, the Canadian uh, astronaut and uh, Italian other countries astronaut, female astronaut. And I'm pretty sure that one woman, one female astronaut here will work on the moon. And this is very important. 
you and just to conclude, I just want to be sure that my daughter or my son will remember the name of this female astronaut as much as I can remember the first the name of the first man who walked on the moon. And this is why we are doing that and this is why we are putting so much effort to do that. So thank you very much.